Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Is sound okay? Sound good, all right. And you can see me okay? You can see my Aloha shirt? <laughs> okay. Uh, where are we now? Where am I? Just ask yourself that. What's happening? What am I? What's happening? What's going on? Eyes open, eyes closed. Doesn't really matter. But see if your awareness can uh, arise with experience. Experience means felt sense experience, like a tactile sensation, uh, an emotion that has substance, character, nature, quality, uh, also texture. Um, mind stream in general, you feel calm, are anxious, degrees of, of focus, of collectedness, the samadhi, the unification, or scattered, dispersed, distracted. All of that is, all, all of those are dhammas, dhammas with a small d, meaning phenomena, things, just the nature of our experience. They're all real because we can experience them. Supersede wrapping them up in the clothes of concept and directly know hardness, softness, smoothness, roughness, heat, cool, movement, stiffness, firmness, oscillation, vibration, emotion of fear, it's heavy, it compresses somewhere like the chest, it darkens, it influences other mental states. It influences the quality of consciousness, the stream of consciousness itself. And unless we have a strong mindful moment that the fear or anxiety uh, can for a while consume the mind, the emotions and body sensations with energy and mindfulness, and some stability, that is some concentration, then it's just a dhamma, it's just a fear moment. It arises not because of anything we did or didn't do. It arises due to conditions, usually old conditioning. Often the stronger the emotion, the older it is. So even though we might have an object of current object of fear or anxiety, uh, some narrative around things that have happened, you know, in memory or recently or now, the stronger the emotion, uh, the more ancient it is in our system. And that can help us relax more and call up that tomo Michelle was talking about yesterday that the hermit Saigyo used with everything. He was a melancholic person and often had melancholic responses to his environment as he traveled to, to the spring and winter, to flowers blossoming or to their death. Uh, and, and so he, he would tomo all these experiences, pleasant or unpleasant, the, the despair or the missing, the, the mourning of, of things that have passed or yet to be. So learning how to, to tomo all these difficult things means to just kind of step back and go, okay, fear is here. Where, where can I feel it? in my neck, in my chest, in my belly, what are the sensations? And then with the intelligence of mindful investigation, we discern which are sensations and which is a fear. They're connected, they're interconnected, but one is physical phenomena. The tightening or the rawness kinds of sensations we might feel in the belly are uh, are on the underside of our arms, you know, our stream of energy that can be connected. And then 
the actual emotion itself and investigate the way I just mentioned how how it feels in the mind the 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 weight the darkening the opposite of metta which is light and uplifting uplifting and connects with with other pleasant and skillful emotions and mind states so mindfulness is not uh, choosing one or the other our, our system of course likes the lightness of joy and metta uh, and rather would not experience the unpleasant nature, fear and anxiety, but there it is. And that's what's washed up due to the intelligence of our practice. The Dhamma is bringing it up. Nothing we did or didn't do. But just allowing it to be there, reflecting on how the mom our moments of pure mindfulness have no agenda. Th it's not trying to get anywhere. Mindfulness isn't seeking liberation. It just touches the truth of the moment, whatever is there, pleasant, unpleasant, fear, anxiety, or, or courage, uh, calm. Doesn't want anything. Mindfulness is uh, it's just, just okay as it is. It's inbuilt in mindfulness is equanimity. In fact, when we look at the seven qualities of awakening and go around uh, from mindfulness to that intelligent discernment to uh, energy to joy or joyous interest, uplifting qualities, and then um, the tranquilizing qualities, calm, concentration, equanimity. Every moment that we're practicing, we're firing up. We're lifting up or bringing out those qualities. And then out of that equanimity comes the very purest mindfulness. Very pure, very innocent, uh, not, even, not even the scent of an agenda or wanting anything, striving, driving, avoiding, resisting. And therefore, it can turn on any of those qualities. Resistance comes up all the time. There's a part of our system rooted in, in delusion, remembering our practice is, is facing and understanding greed, hatred, delusion. It is facing, feeling, and understanding that is the causative factor for them to, to weaken, back off, drop away, ultimately be uprooted altogether. Lobha is wanting, grasping, clinging. Dosa, often a better word to me than aversion or anger, because it covers everything that is uh, under the dosa or hatred psychological root, from minor irritation to disturbance, uh, to a uh, little bit of uh, anger, to more anger, intense anger, to violent thoughts, speech, actions, uh, to war. It's all dosa, all comes under dosa. Loba, uh, clinging, greed. Dosa, all the aversive states, all the perme permuation, permutations of it. Subtless to the largest. We want to know why there's war. Look in our heart. Understand our own dosa. Uh, there would not be loba, clinging. There would not be dosa, aversion, uh, without moha, delusion. You take delusion out of the equation, and there's not the confusion that causes us by a habit to grasp after phenomena. The wanting mind that's looking for security, looking for happiness, looking for something. It, it's, it's the confusion or bewilderment of moha, not seeing nature as it really is, that makes us grasp after empty things for the security of self, for the sense of self, 
for the protection of a the sense of a separate, solid, permanent self that is a fiction. It isn't really there. So that it can only happen with the, the moha, delusion, confusion, bewilderment. So our mindfulness doesn't care about any of this, since it's without any wanting, without any aversion, and without any confusion about things. That's its mirror-like nature and purpose. It just arises in, in a moment of things coming together. So for example, seeing depends on light coming into the body through this particular incredible magic, mysterious organ that we call uh, the physical eye, the eye door. And the inner sensitivity of the eye receives the, the stream of light, the light particles or light waves. That's the reality, that's the felt experience, that's what we can know. And in the moment of knowing, we overcome, there's not the greed, there's not the hatred, and there's very little delusion. There's always some remainder until we're completely awakened, but very little when we're very mindful and are just uh, abiding at the eye door, feeling, recognizing, taking in the light, and shadow, color, and form. And with mindfulness, this is at a preconceptual level before we name it, before we name the form as a chair, as a person, as a voice. The same with the ear door, uh, uh, biting right at the ear door, receiving the sound vibrations. There's nothing we need to do. The sound by itself, it, it's, uh, phenomena, it's some combination of earth, uh, water, fire, and air, uh, friction. So it's, it's mostly earth element and air element. That, that's what causes sound. And that comes into the body. And mindfulness knows it, knows it at the moment that it strikes the inner sensitivity of the ear, same way as the light strikes the inner sensitivity of the eye. And the largest organ of our body, of our, of our being, is this, our skin and flesh. And it receives impressions, the impressions of the elements, the textures of the earth element, and the movement or cohesion of the water element, the temperature range of the fire element, and either the, the support, firmness, or movement oscillation, vibration of the air element. The body receives all of that. And it's the body awareness knowing the body as it really is, not as my belly and my feet and my hands and my breath. At a certain point of stillness, when form starts to fall away or back off or, or become transparent, we don't know the end of the the skin and the beginning of air. Uh, we don't know where one hand leaves off and the other begins. Uh, and uh, we might open our eyes in meditation. And just for a few moments there, <coughs> the whole visual field is pixelating. It's not immediately forming into the objects that we've spent our lifetime uh, firming up. That's a table, that's a bowl, that's a photo, that's a door. As a fan, R rather in this meditative moment where it's just a pure, innocent mindfulness coming right out of an equanimous moment, seeing light and shadow and, and their play, like shadow dancing, color and form. So too with the body, to know the body as it really is, as form gives way, it's not such and such sensations are occurring, pressure in the shoulder, and, um, and tightening, pulling, twisting in my leg or, or aching in the lower back. It's just the sensations as they are. And with the form falling away, it's just, it's just in space somewhere here in our field of awareness, our felt sense awareness of phenomena. We can't place it anywhere. It would take the effort to engage 
the thinking mind to say uh, where it is in the body. We don't need to know where it is. You can just let the phenomena hang in space and just be with the phenomena. The more we can do that, the better it is for the meditative development, cultivation. The, the quieter we become. Think how it is when we're thinking a lot. It's tiring, isn't it? Especially if it's the same rotation of thoughts, the same story, the same drama, that again and again nature of it rolling around, rolling around and resisting it, somehow pulled back to it. The, the weight and the weariness of thought and how refreshing it is when it, it backs off. We're not making an enemy of it. It's not our goal to get rid of thoughts. But when the mindful, silent awareness, mindful stream is strong, it's such a restful place. It puts us into such a place of repose and relaxation. So if there are thoughts, they're just like leaves blowing by in the distance. And only the leaves that blow right into our face or our eye uh, do we attend to, you know, oh, pick this up, put it down with that tomo befriending uh, kind of awareness. So to, to follow along and see how, how the, as these days go along and we get quieter, calmer, uh, even if the rough stuff comes up, uh, in fact, you know, the deeper we go and, and, the, and the more profound our practice, the more likely f that there will be this resistance. There will be new layers of difficult states or, or the moha, the delusion works. It's one of its, one of its um, aspects is, is to resist awakening, to resist doing the practice. After, in months of months of, of practice with Upandita, for example, uh, and, uh, and when he'd feel, when he'd feel that my system was getting close to an insight and very balanced, uh, at the right times he, he would, he would issue an admonition, admonition. He'd say, be, be aware of that part of your awareness, a part of your mind that either anticipates or resists. Anticipates that something's gonna happen, then we prevent that from happening. You know, especially an insight or, or, or resist. So somehow we sabotage and th start thinking about something or shift our attention for, from the very subtle place that, that it is resting. Very quiet abiding, for example. Something sabotages it and distracts us. Or, and that's the kind of resistance that arises due to the, the moha. Moha, greed, hatred, and delusion are the, uh, like Mara, the per the, the mythic personification of greed, hatred, and delusion, whose job it is to have humans be distracted by sense pleasures, sense experience. The Buddhist teaching was there are pleasures from the body and the sense stores, uh, and there are our birthright, and, and they have this effect. And they're not good or bad, they, they just are. And here's the danger attachment and aversion. There are these other pleasures called Dhamma pleasures, spiritual joy, spiritual gladness, spiritual happiness. Uh, and they, they aren't dependent on anything. They're, it's non-dependent joy, non-dependent happiness, not dependent on things being a certain way, on the environment being a certain way, on our sense doors being filled with pleasant sights, sounds, sensations, and imaginings. They're not dependent on anything. Uh, so, so this 
this awareness because moha is often not easy. It, it's it, it's it's subtle. That's why it can. That's why greed and hatred can exist. Greed and hatred aren't so subtle. They're intensely grasping or wanting, or intensely pushing away, avoiding. Very pleasant or very unpleasant, and at their extremes. And and, uh, and and moha keeps it locked, keeps them locked into our system. Like this is the best of it. It's all we're going to get. And so to be observant of that, and if we distill the practice all the way down, there's several ways to do that. But one of the ways is our practice is uh, dispelling the darkness of delusion and doubt with the light of wisdom, the light and the confidence of seeing as it is, the as it is nature of things. But even now, if uh, we look at, we look into our experience. Where is aware? Where is awareness now in the body, and what is it feeling? What sensations? What mental moods? What happens when we ask ourselves, you know, where is awareness? What is it noticing? The anchor of a, a global awareness of the body, the whole body energy field? Are there particular touchstones that we might use? Sit bones, hands, feet. And the breath, which is the body as well, can that be felt, can that be seen? Sometimes in the rising and falling process, uh, as our, our system grows still and quiet, particularly with a calm concentration, equanimity, very subtle. We're not sure if the breath process is in its rising mode or falling mode. We don't need to know. All, all we might be experiencing is, is pressure and textures and fluidity and propelling and firming, tightening, pushing, relaxing, softening, lightening, release. We won't know anything about the breath. There's no breath. There's no body. Just this play of elemental nature. Dhammas practicing and behaving in themselves. This is what the Buddha instructed us to do first with mindfulness to explore and understand the body as, as it is, the body as the body, meaning the body as the elements of nature, earth, water, fire, air. And to know it in that elemental cellular level, as well as in all its transition modes, when we move, we move about reach for things, turn, stand, eat, bathe. So the postures themselves, it's helpful when we're sitting to know we're sitting, when we're standing to know that is no experience, to know the felt sense experience of, of standing and walking. Just if we're walking and knowing we're walking, that's powerful practice. We don't always have to be doing the microscopic lifting, moving, placing. It's useful at times to drop to the next level of, of calm or concentrative stillness. But really, we're just wanting to know whatever is happening, sitting, standing, walking, laying down. When you lay down to rest or you lay down to sleep, we usually associate it with rest or sleep. By practicing in the lying posture, we'll begin to associate that along with the other postures as a meditation posture, not as a, the means for rest and sleep only. He gave us, the Buddha gave us a second domain of awareness 
uh, extremely powerful, often perhaps unemphasized or under undertaught or misunderstood. Uh, that's the ray realm of our domain of of feeling tone. Here, feelings uh, um, not as emotions, but but simply that immediate affect response to a sense imprint, visual light to the inner sensitivity of the eye door, sound vibration to the sensitivity of the ear door, elemental nature to the sensitivity of the body, uh, thoughts, images through the uh, mind-body base of, of the mind. That a moment of contact in the immediacy of their contact, there's a pleasant or unpleasant or neutral feeling tone. It's a profound portal toward insight and awakening. Why is that? The strength of habit because of moha, of delusion, confusion, is to associate pleasant feeling with attachment or grasping or clinging. And because of the force of, of delusion and its, and its companions, greed and hatred, attachment and aversion, unpleasant feelings too, without awareness, without mindfulness, <clears throat> goes immediately from the unpleasant feeling tone to aversion. So pleasant to attachment, unpleasant to aversion. It sort of makes sense. <clears throat> and uh, all of us as yogis have, have been or continue to go through that strong, habitual training. We, we've trained for it. We've practiced greed, hatred, and delusion by going right from unpleasant to aversion. Don't dislike, don't want, push away, run from. And by habit, we've been practicing greed and attachment, because we, we go right from pleasant to wanting it, holding on to it. First, just the tanha, the, the normal attachment, the, the second noble truth, which keeps the engine of, of dukkha going, attachment being the cause of, of distress, anxiety, you know, all the forms of dukkha. It's important to see that activity. It's important to see how that works uh, in a moment. If we don't see it right away, the, the tanha becomes upadana, which is excessive attachment, which is the one we want to most be watchful of because that sort of catalyzes our habitual way of being, thinking, speaking, acting. And it sort of resets our intentions, our motivations, often out of that attachment, what, what we want or what we think we need to do or what we think other people need to do, and uh, the, our views, as Jesse was talking about, it, it really, uh, it sets them in glue almost. And it's much harder to extricate ourselves from. So when we are right on the tip of a potential insight and that delusion kind of comes in to say, oh no, you don't want to do that. You know, it's almost like sometimes there is a voice, but uh, the, the resistance, like a magnetic pull away from going in, you know, or, or letting go or jumping off, you know, uh, the refusal, refusal to do that is the delusion that's there. And then subtle attachments, no, 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 you know, that's not where pleasure is, it's not where happiness is. Because the pleasure and the happiness that we, we've been accustomed to, that we've been practicing all our lives, is based on, on receiving and holding on to the, the pleasant experience of sights, sounds, sensations, smells, tastes, and thoughts, and the resistance or rejection of the unpleasant ones. So here, the portal is just, well, well, wait a minute. When there's pain, when there's something really unpleasant, 
just say, well, well, wait a minute, you know, if the Saigyo can, can pause and make poems and create his tomo cocoon around difficult states, perhaps we can do the same thing and say, wait a minute, when, when there's something unpleasant and we immediately want to jump into something, a judgment about that, or, or, or move away, move our bodies or move our mind away from it. Well, wait a minute, what, what is this? You know, yeah, there's pressure, there's twisting, there's pain, or there's this anxiety and there's this fear, there's this intense resistance. What if we just abide in the awareness of those unpleasant physical or emotional states? And then notice what their affective feeling tone is, separate from the sensation or the emotion. Abide knowing unpleasant feeling tone. And noticing when it jumps to aversion, noticing when it doesn't, when it's simply unpleasant. All beings, all sentient beings, have pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. They don't necessarily have attachment, aversion, delusion. And we, in our human form, have this capacity, as the Buddha and other wise women and men have taught us, to know these subtleties, to know these differences, so that when there's, when there's pleasant, and the liking of the pleasant, we don't have to proliferate on that to spin off into the wanting, the attachment, and the, and the sealing of that attachment and the upadana, intense craving, grasping, clinging. Oh, and if it goes there, then we notice that. We notice that clenching around it. Or, or we notice the lesser, tanha, just the, the subtle wanting of that. And if we notice it clearly, we notice it with understanding and care, it, 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 we see that it, it's just moments of it. It's not solid, unbroken wanting, just the one wanting moment followed by another wanting moment or one clinging moment followed by another clinging moment. Just like the fear moments, you know, one solid wall of fear. It's just the conditions that allow them to arise some, sometimes with a certain frequency. And then that makes them seem more solid and ongoing. When I was walking in a forest in, in a monastery in Southern Thailand, wait, waiting to get a visa to go back to Burma, I, I came out one morning and there was a log across the pathway on the way to uh, where we go on the Pindapat alms rounds. So I was a monk then. And if I got closer to the log, I wonder why, why it was there. I hadn't heard anything fall in the night. I got closer, closer, and then I saw that it was moving, like kind of undulating. And so knowing this forest, I, I knew there were large snakes, vipers and cobras and pythons. And the closer I got, um, the bigger the, this log became, and then I was certain it was a python. It, it, crossing the path, and by its undulation, I said, this must be a really big python, six feet, eight feet, 12 feet, 18 feet. It just kept going and going. I thought it was an endless long python. Uh, and uh, curiosity got the better of my fear and terror, so I got closer and closer, you know, observe, observe its colors. It seemed to have these patterns of green and, and uh, and brown and black and you know, it was kind of oh wow it's really cool so you know several more foolish steps toward the python until i was standing right over it and i saw it was a very wide trail of marching ants crossing the path from a distance and its undulation it's a perception a perception of this large python snake from a further distance, the perception of a, of a hard, solid rock. Well, so we're doing the same thing. And this particular portal of feeling tone, Vedana is the term for, for feelings, 
pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feelings. By pausing and abiding in the awareness of feeling tone, pleasant, 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 and instead of the training, the past habit of, of going immediately into attachment and wanting, and the training of being with unpleasant, 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 instead of our long time practice of going right to aversion, resistance, rejection, and so forth, we just abide, abide noticing, abide. And then we see the breakup of things. That's how we know there's just these fear moments, like, like the log to the snake to the ants, that seem like this solid wall, uh, unbreakable and uh, permanent and me and mine, self and so forth. But there's just these moments of discomfort that proliferate into the story, uh, coded and fed by attachments and aversions and confusion, bewilderment, greed, hatred, delusion, loba, dosa, moha. With this doorway of knowing the truth, because pleasant is not unskillful. Pleasant is not bad. Uh, I mean, pleasant is not skillful and it's something to pursue. And unpleasant is not something unskillful, uh, unwholesome, and that should be avoided. We've had them since we we're in the womb. We've had them at birth. We've had them all our life. Pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. When we're really mindful, they're just what they are. Pleasant is not attachment. The pleasant sights and sounds, sensations and thoughts. And unpleasant is not in self, aversion to unpleasant sights, sounds, sensations, imaginings, creativity, consciousness. It's just the truth. Unpleasant happens to every sentient being and pleasant happens to every sentient being. And it's just what it is. And if we're with it just as it is, that's awakening. So in that subtle moment, just before a potential insight or awakening, when Sayadaw cautions against expectation or the resistance, the self-destructiveness of moha, just to pause. What's the feeling tone? Or what's, what's the mind state first, perhaps? And then to catch it even more subtly, is it pleasant? You know, without attachment, just pleasant. Is it unpleasant? If there's fear, that anticipation of fear, it's a dhamma fear in this case, a healthy practice fear, not born of dosa. Nevertheless, it's fear. Can we just feel the feeling tone? It's still unpleasant, even if it's a healthy dhamma fear. And so wisely, we just stay and rest, abide in knowing the unpleasantness and therefore knowing these, this particular fear. And then we see the fear clearly, it drops away. Then the potential for an insight or an awakening moment is great. And the third of the feeling tones, <clears throat> obviously pleasant feeling tone is associated, uh, can be associated because of attachment to greed and unpleasant uh, associated by lack of awareness to, to hatred. The neutral feeling tones without awareness is connected with delusion. So often we might feel in a neutral place, which is also the same quality of, of the awakening qual factor of equanimity. Equanimity is neither pleasant nor unpleasant. but there's no delusion there. There's no mistake in it. If there is delusion there, then it's likely to be indifference, like equanimity. It's likely to be dissociation, disconnection, seemingly like equanimity, but there's no life, there's no spark, there's no connection with reality. There's no visceral intensity there in, in a healthy way, no dhamma progress. It's suspended when we're caught in that disconnect. And we have to see it and recognize it and understand, oh yeah, that's, that's flat. That's just flat. That's just 
uh, uh, not non-caring. Real equanimity, there's caring. There's compassion that allows us then out of that equanimity to act most skillfully with thoughts and speech and actions. So these feeling tones are powerful. Look in the body now. Can, can you find in the body anywhere that sensations are pleasant? The body means the senses too. So with sounds that you hear, can you find in the body and sense fields, pleasant feeling tone? And then can you find somewhere in the body unpleasant feeling tone? You know, connected with, with a place where there's pain or heat or pressure. And if so, can you just abide knowing unpleasant without even the hint of resistance, aversion, irritation, judgment, unkindness? And then in the body, senses, sounds, images, can you find a neutral feeling tone? So neither pleasant nor unpleasant. It's not dead. It's not unfeeling. It's not a disconnect or dissociation. It's just a, it's just even, neither sprouting, pleasant experience, happy mind states, or unpleasant sense experience, unhappy mind states. Anytime, anytime we want to enter this domain of Vedana, feeling tone, just go to the body and see, is there pleasant, is there pleasant sensations with pleasant feeling tone arising now? Or is there Unpleasant experience, unpleasant feeling tone in association with sensations or experience of the body or senses. Neutral feeling tone is more subtle. Doesn't have the same intensity as pleasant and unpleasant. The textures there are, are more pronounced, not difficult to find pleasant, unpleasant. Neutral is more like looking at air or feeling still air. We find it when the mind is in more equipoise, balance. So equanimity begins the very first moment we're mindful. We don't have to wait for it to go through all these qualities. That necklace of jewels, mindfulness, uh, the intelligent discernment of investigation, the courageous joy that keeps us concurrent each moment, keeps mindfulness concurrent in, in, um, in sync with this moment's experience. And then that wondrous kind of joy that comes from interest in what's happening, especially when the, as form kind of falls away, 
the very wonder of these bodies and senses, the, the magical mystery nature of them. That's often called piti. Some of you have been mentioning that, uh, the experience of piti, sometimes that re seem to reconfigure, recalibrate the body in, in these involuntary movements are the sense of feeling lifted up or washed over. Most often pleasant, but sometimes the jumping and jerking is actually unpleasant, even though it's an awakening quality, this joyous interest, piti. And when those energizing qualities are, are there, we, we have all the fuel we need to carry on, no matter if the experience is, is pleasant or unpleasant. But we don't want it too excitable or over energetic because then we'll crash. We need, we need it to be even and balanced. So then that necklace of jewels, uh, next comes the calm, tranquility, where our systems start feeling softer, pliant, flexible. And then the, the collectedness, the, the Kalyana Samadhi, the beautiful oneness of mind. Unification, stillness, where the, we begin to integrate all of our experience all our pleasant, unpleasant, neutral experience, all the states, difficult emotions, pleasant emotions, here they begin to integrate as the samadhi grows deeper. It just makes room, wraps around, either with awareness or in combination with the Brahma Viharas. The Buddha taught how we can practice these seven awakening factors uh, with the Brahma Viharas in each Brahma Vihara with each of these awakening factors alongside of them. And that actually lifts them, that lifts them up and matures them. So the Samadhi becomes more expansive and more unified and more able to work with difficult states. And we feel further stability and self-integration. And then finally, the, the issuing and the equanimity, the peace that holds all states, pleasant, unpleasant, good and bad, so-called, gain and loss, holds it all with understanding that this is nature. So although there's a linear way of talking about it, th these all turn on at once. That necklace is like lights up every time we're mindful. And that's why we can move about when our energy feels excited. We can, we can uh, call up calm or concentration or equanimity. And when the mind feels like it's sinking you know, too much, overly focused, uh, and that awareness feels like it's getting claustrophobic, then we can call up joy or energy, or that discerning awareness that investigates something and sees whether it's this or that, that physical or mental. Is this a skillful approach or unskillful approach? We ask that question, but we don't answer it conceptually. We, we let the discernment, which is another word for wisdom, tell us. So using wise reflection, reminding ourselves why, what are we practicing? Well, we're practicing mindfulness. How do we practice mindfulness? With what, what there is. And what there is, is this body. There is this body. And there are these feeling tones, just three of them. Although 
many degrees. Pleasant feeling tone, unpleasant feeling tone, neutral feeling tone. And thirdly, the Buddha asked us to explore chitta, the heart, the heart mind. Uh, all of the, all, and all the qualities that arise from the heart mind. All the mental states, emotions, <clears throat> along with the fourth domain of awareness, which is phenomena, dhammas, plural, all of the phenomena, which we can just say simply, what we see arising through the body and sense doors. So together, those last two is our mental experience and, and physical, of course, the awareness of phenomena issuing in the body. The body, the feeling tone, chitta, consciousness itself on the subtlest level, the other mental states, and then the phenomena, particular mental states like the difficult ones of the hindrances and the useful awakening ones like the seven awakening factors, the four Brahma Viharas. That's, that's our area. This is our world, it's our meditative world. And by extension, it's the world we live in everywhere, the lens out of which we experience ourselves and other, all other sentient life. And then I elaborated on mindfulness as being in essence the, the whole collection of the awakening factors. Every moment of that pure, innocent, no agenda, mindful awareness has all the other wisdom factors in it. Discernment, energy, joy, uplifting, energizing and the tranquilizing qualities are there all packed in through that one moment of mindfulness calm concentration unification equanimity the expansive unconditional peaceful acceptance of things as they are here and now. Just seeing what's happened in the last few minutes, seeing what's happening in your body, uh, or if you, if you wish, you call up one or more of the Brahma Viharas the last couple of minutes. As I'm, as I'm sitting here and doing what I just instructed, feeling my own body, there's heat, pronounced sensations, connected some with the, the energy. Uh, lifted the Dhamma energy from giving this talk and some some calm, some equanimity, 
kind of following along what I was talking about, trying to feel it. And looking around in my room and I, I see my empty water glass and I see the door. And when we end, I know I'm gonna get up and go out that door, go down and, and fill my glass with water. It, it reminds me of when I was practicing <clears throat> and I'd be given an instruction in Burma by a teacher who's really into walking and convinced me to walk. He said, because I wasn't walking, I thought meditation was mostly sitting and I was doing much more sitting. He said, okay, I'll let you just sit. Um, but first, I just want you to walk for two weeks. And then if you want to just sit, just sit. So I agreed. And I did the walking by the schedule for two weeks. <coughs> and, um, and I took to it. I paid attention. And at the end of the walking, I could feel energy and calm. And I could feel them coming together. And I would follow that energy and calm and concentration back to the sitting. And my sittings were better. And after the sittings, I'd go back out and, and lift the practice energy from, from the walking. Speed didn't really matter. I, I played with all the speeds. Very, 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 very slow. And, and more medium and, and quicker. Just to gain skill with all of them knowing that under different circumstances I would be moving at different speeds and I, I wanted to I wanted to be mindful at the same time. So mostly in retreats we try to encourage you to walk at the speed that is most supporting mindfulness. <coughs> <clears throat> but when I'd be practicing I would look at where I had to go. So maybe the door is 20 feet from where I'm sitting. I'm saying, how am I going to get, how am I going to get from here to there? There's a few million mind moments between here and there. And wh what am I going to pay attention to? You know, normally just grab the glass and, and uh, put my watch back on, close the computer and, and kind of get up and go and not really know. But with the instructions from Utundara, this, this teacher really skilled at walking, you know, he said, when you're gonna lift your leg, you, you know you're about to lift, but you have, you have no idea what the experience is gonna be. It's always a mystery. We have an intention to move, and we have an intention to think something or feel something. And if we pause right there and feel that impulse of intention, we know we're about to follow with the willful action, intentional conscious action. But we have no idea what the experience is going to be. So it's just a setup. I know. Soon I'm about to do things right here with the computer and my headphones. And then I'll have to bend the body and push and get up and turn and look and see, and then take the steps, the necessary steps at whatever speed to support my mindfulness and get to that door. How it's gonna be, I have no idea. It's always a mystery. So with that in mind, please continue your practice. Thanks, Michelle, I can't hear it. I see you ringing it. I need a new bell. Okay. <laughs> What's happening? There you go.
thank all of you yogis. Thank you for your practice. It's, it means so much to us. We're really enjoying this and holding each and every one of you. Almost empty. <laughs>